Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The subject of this issue is the German novel Perfume. It is often said that humans are visual creatures. Every day, we rely on our eyes to receive a wide range of information. For many people, the first thing they do upon waking up is to pick up their phones and see what's happening in the world. This often leads us to overlook the influence of another sense, our sense of smell. Modern scientific research has confirmed that our sensitivity to and reaction to smells are far stronger than we realize. Smells continuously send signals to our brains on a subconscious level. The novel Perfume presents an even bolder hypothesis, that smells can be used to manipulate the behavior of others, and whoever controls smells can become the master of the world. The protagonist of the novel, Grinui, is a genius when it comes to his sense of smell. He can distinguish and remember every scent in the world. His ultimate goal in life is to find the most perfect scent in the world and preserve it as a perfume. What's horrifying is that this particular scent only exists in a few red-haired girls, and in pursuit of his desire, Grinui kills 25 red-haired girls to create a perfume that can enchant everyone. But can he truly find satisfaction in this? Can this seemingly perfect perfume really make its users feel happiness? Now, let's delve into this novel and uncover the secrets behind this thrilling story. The author of Perfume, Patrick Suskind, was born in Munich in 1949, a time when Germany had not yet been unified, and his region belonged to West Germany. Perfume is his most famous work. It began serialization in newspapers in the autumn of 1984 and, when published in 1985, sold 300,000 copies that year. It was later translated into 25 languages. By the early 1990s, global sales of perfume had already exceeded 2 million copies. In 2006, a film adaptation of the novel with the same title earned over a billion dollars worldwide. The story of perfume is set in 18th century enlightened Madeira, Paris. Today, when we think of Paris, we automatically associate it with beautiful, romantic adjectives. However, during that time, Paris was a dirty and overcrowded city, with hundreds of thousands of people crammed together, no air conditioning, no proper drainage system, and not enough space to bury the dead. The resulting stench was unimaginable. The worst of it was a food market built on top of a graveyard. In 1738, Grenouille was born on a fish stall in that market. His mother was only 25 years old but had already given birth to four children whom she abandoned in the garbage under the fish stall, leaving them to fend for themselves. Fortunately, Grinui was stronger than his siblings, and his cries were heard from the trash heap, leading to his rescue. His mother, on the other hand, was executed for infanticide. He was eventually taken to a monastery, where the church paid for a wet nurse to care for him. He was given an ironically meaningful name, John Baptiste Grinui. The first part of his name was the same as that of a beheaded saint, while the second part, Grinui, is French for frog, a creature capable of breathing through its skin, foreshadowing his unique talent. If one word were to sum up young Grinui's childhood, it would be grim. The wet nurse refused to feed him, claiming he lacked the usual baby scent, calling him a monster, and returned him to an elder within the church. Initially, the elder did not believe the wet nurse's words. But then Grinui woke up and began greedily smelling himself, sniffing with such intensity like a hostile animal. This terrified the elder, who subsequently sent Grinui to an orphanage. However, the other children in the orphanage quickly realized they couldn't smell Grinui's scent. This frightened them, and they attempted to kill Grinui in various ways. But they also dared not get too close to this freak, so they never succeeded. In reality, aside from lacking a scent, Grinui was a very ordinary child in terms of physical appearance and intelligence. He didn't start speaking until very late because he learned vocabulary through smell, making abstract concepts, especially ethical and moral principles, incomprehensible to him. It was this very trait that foreshadowed the tragedy to come. When Grinui was eight years old, the church suddenly stopped providing money to the orphanage. The orphanage director, eager to make a profit, sold Grinui as a laborer to a tanner. There, Grinui performed all sorts of dirty and exhausting tasks, with terrible living conditions and food. 
However, he persisted for five years and finally gained one hour of free time every evening. From then on, he could roam Paris freely, smelling all kinds of scents without discrimination and storing them in his mind. One evening, he accidentally smelled an incredibly wonderful scent that made him feel like he couldn't go on living without possessing it. He tracked down a red-haired girl who was slicing plums. The girl emitted the sweetest and purest fragrance he could imagine. Grinui strangled the girl and greedily absorbed every wisp of scent from her corpse. For the first time in his life, he understood the concept of happiness and began differentiating between the millions of scents in his memory, learning to distinguish between good and bad. Until then, his goal had simply been to survive. But now he realized he was the only person in the world capable of capturing the beauty of sense. He thus confirmed the direction of his destiny, to become the greatest perfumer. At that time, Paris already had specialized perfumers. Nobles and aristocrats were willing to spend generously on perfumes to mask the odors of themselves and their surroundings. One such perfumer was named Baldini, who had been in the business for years but was experiencing declining fortunes. He lacked creativity and the ability to develop new fragrances, while his competitors were introducing new products every season. On the brink of bankruptcy and contemplating retirement, Grinui unexpectedly helped him replicate a competitor's perfume while delivering leather to him, and he requested to become Baldini's apprentice. Baldini saw a glimmer of hope in him, someone who could rejuvenate his business, and bought Grinui from the tanner. With Grinui's continuous creation of new perfume formulas, Baldini's perfume business began to flourish once more. Here, Grinui learned the art of perfume blending and the techniques of distillation. However, this did not satisfy him. Grinui discovered that this technique couldn't extract the scents of all substances, such as stones, glass, or the water of the Seine River. He couldn't preserve the scents he perceived, which filled him with despair leading him to fall seriously ill. Just as he was on the brink of death, Baldini informed him that there was a better method for extracting scents to learn in the southern city of Grasse. This good news revitalized Grinui overnight. After leaving countless perfume formulas with Baldini over three years, he was finally allowed to leave Paris and embark on a journey to Grasse. In the first half of the novel, the author follows the writing style of 19th century realism meticulously describing Paris of the time, creating an extensive panorama of the customs of the era. Readers can almost feel like they are there, observing and experiencing the essence of this period. Unlike the traditional visual perspective of novels, the author chooses the sense of smell to present the city's details. Although Susskind never explicitly disclosed the inspiration for the novel, many critics mention a historical book called The Scented Ape which considers French history as a history of smells, describing 18th and 19th century Paris as a gathering place for various foul odors. Susskind adopts a similar approach by telling the history of smells, an aspect unrecognized but just as important as visual history during the Enlightenment era, freeing the novel from the constraints of the soil of realism and creating new space for its boundless imagination. Looking back on Grenouille's life so far, we seem to witness a condensed history of industrial society's development. Grinui must throw himself into the economic engine of capitalism and become a small cog in the machinery of capitalism to survive. In this era dominated by rationalism, where the pursuit of profit is paramount, individuals can be replaced and sacrificed at any moment. Ironically, behind Grinui, a string of deaths is left. The orphanage director tragically dies amid inflation. The tanner, who took Grinui's sale proceeds, drowns in the river after getting drunk. As for Baldini, perhaps he kept too much money in his shop, his house collapses from a bridge, and he and his wife die together. Whether intentionally or unintentionally, those characters who had exploited and used Grinui to amass wealth become his stepping stones. After contributing to his life at a certain stage, they ultimately meet their demise. The author portrays Grinui as a flea, insignificant and unnoticed, but surviving by sucking the blood of the host. This may be because, unlike the other characters in the novel, his pursuit has nothing to do with society's defined power or success. What he desires lies entirely outside the dominant social system, allowing him to exist in the shadows. But can he truly remain outside the mainstream society?
Let's continue reading to find out. Leaving behind the suffocating human scent of the city, Grinui took his first breath of the refreshing natural air. In order to avoid the nauseating human scent that repulsed him, he steered clear of the city and crowds, climbing to a remote mountaintop. Apart from meeting his most basic survival needs, he laid in a mountain cave, ruling over his olfactory kingdom. He felt like a great Grinui, the master of this kingdom, contentedly immersing himself in the world of his imagination, living alone for seven years. However, one day he suddenly realized that despite possessing all the sense, he himself was an odorless person. To resolve this existential crisis, he descended from the high mountain and returned to civilization. After descending from the mountain, Grinui fabricated a false story about being robbed by bandits and locked in a cave for seven years. By chance, he encountered a count deeply engrossed in scientific research. This count believed that gases produced by the soil were harmful to humans. As Grinui had lived in a rotting soil environment for seven years, he became the ideal subject for the count to confirm his theory. The count provided Grinui with fresh food and clean clothes, sprinkling him with violet perfume. Grinui lied to the count, claiming that violets also grew from the soil and that violet perfume was naturally harmful. The count believed his words, allowing Grinui to have free reign. Grinui took the opportunity to create a scent that mimicked human fragrance. He applied this perfume, entered society, and for the first time, he was accepted, no longer seen as an outsider. Ironically, the essence of this perfume hidden beneath the floral scent consisted of cat feces, spoiled cheese, vinegar, and other filthy elements. Grinui finally realized his true talent. He could control the reactions of others using scent, and as long as he wished, he could master everyone's heart. For people could close their eyes to greatness, to horrors, to beauty, and their ears to melodies or deceiving words. But they could not escape scent, for scent was a brother of breath. If one breathed in deeply of that scent, it entered into one's very core, and dislodged everything that lay there and in dislodging it, took possession of it. One was quite lost, one's personality completely changed, one was filled with a passionate, yearning desire for the object that had aroused it. As expected, the Count gained immense prestige with Grenouille's perfume, but he himself remained immersed in the fantasy of his great gas theory, climbing alone to a peak 2,800 meters high, leading to his own demise. Meanwhile, Grenouille continued his journey and reached his destination from seven years ago, Grasse. Here, he once again smelled the perfect aroma of a young girl. This time, he was determined to fulfill his unfinished quest and capture the scent. He spent two years learning the art of distillation and enfleurage at a perfume workshop, successfully extracting scents from lifeless objects. Afterward, he conducted experiments on animals and humans, successfully extracting scents from living creatures. Yet, this was not enough to appease his restless soul. What haunted him were the scents of those purest red-haired girls. He believed it was an extremely rare scent capable of arousing love. To achieve this goal, he went on to kill 24 girls, sparking great panic in the region. However, he remained quiet for three months, and the locals believed the danger had passed. But one man named Rickhis didn't think so. This Rickhis was a powerful senator, and coincidentally, his daughter was a beautiful red-haired maiden. He suspected that his daughter would be the next target of the murderer, and fled with her to a distant land. However, Grinui, with his acute sense of smell, tracked their whereabouts and followed the Rick his family. Although this pursuit exposed Grinui's actions, he obtained the final precious scent. Soon after, Grinui was arrested, and the court sentenced him to be nailed to a cross. On the day of his execution, Grinui opened the perfect perfume he had created. Over 10,000 people in the audience fell into a collective frenzy, worshipping him like a deity. Rick is even wanted to acknowledge him as his son. Grinui succeeded, but he didn't feel happy. Instead, he saw through the facade of this false happiness and grew to hate those who blindly followed him. He suddenly realized that he could never find satisfaction in love, and what his perfume could bring him was only endless false affection. He quietly left Grasse and returned to Paris. At midnight, he walked into a group of beggars, sentencing himself to death with his own perfume. 
the scent of his unparalleled perfume drove people to madness. Thus, these beggars tore him apart, devoured him, leaving no trace behind. Grenouille's story ends abruptly. It's difficult to discern whether what we've just read is a true story or a mysterious legend. The novel's description of Parisian history and its detailed account of the perfume-making process create a realistic atmosphere, while Grenouille's experiences border on the supernatural, with a fairy tale-like quality. The novel consists of 51 very short chapters, some of which are less than two pages long. This unusual writing style makes all the passing characters in Grenouille's life appear insignificant, creating a certain distance between the reader and Grenouille's story. He may be the only genius in literary history known for his olfactory abilities, and he represents a modern variation of the romantic mad genius with an antisocial personality. He is both an artist and a criminal, making perfume seem like a blend of the coming-of-age and crime novel genres. But delving deeper, it's actually an anti-coming-of-age novel where the protagonist, although maturing in skills, progressively moves towards his own demise in the process of establishing his individual identity. It's also an anti-crime novel, subverting the traditional detective crime novel's predictable and controllable unraveling of the case, instead telling, observing, and recording everything from the perspective of the criminal. The novel is set in the Age of Enlightenment, where the dominant paradigm was one of reason and visual perception. People relied on images to understand, manipulate, and even dominate nature, particularly those natural activities that were beyond human comprehension or posed threats to human survival, such as volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunamis, and more. In simpler terms, they captured these events on paper or canvas to tame them. Therefore, despite Grenouille being an exceptionally rare genius, he left no trace in history because everything about him belonged to the ephemeral kingdom of sense. The author juxtaposes reason and intuition by using both visual and olfactory elements in the story, uncovering a hidden facet of enlightenment rationality. As a genius of smell, Grenouille himself had no scent at all. From birth, his survival instinct overpowered any need for love. His mother, who could have provided warmth and love, had to die for him to live. Thus, for Grenouille, love stood in opposition to survival. Whenever he attempted to express or experience love, death would inevitably follow. The childhood trauma led to his pathological and deficient self-awareness. Grenouille's attempts to extract and preserve the essence of a particular entity through distillation can be seen as an unconscious effort to refine an individual identity. This attempt, which is not unrelated to post-war Germany's attempt to reconstruct a normalized national identity, might have been chosen because of the Nazi culture's exploitation of visual symbols. The author used the element of olfaction as a path for Grenouille's self-awareness. Considering that during the serialization of the novel in 1984, there was an epic TV series Heimat directed by Edgar Wrights, which created a television sensation, the theme of returning home in the novel's ending might also metaphorically reflect the significance of the theme of homeland in post-war German literature and cinema. By presenting everything familiar through artistic means, which could resonate with readers and viewers, individuals could reevaluate and establish their own circumstances. However, in post-war Germany, this approach was inevitably trapped in a sense of emptiness. In modern rational self-awareness, the core driving force for individual development is the desire to control, manipulate, and dominate all aspects of nature to construct a world driven by reason. Grenouille's journey from an instinctive follower of sense as a child to a skilled perfumer corresponds to this manipulation and mastery of knowledge. Ironically, mastering this mainstream language does not open up enough living space for him. Just as humans try to conceal their body odors, considering overly strong personal sense as uncivilized, the sense of smell is often associated with the animalistic aspect of human nature. This contradicts the pursuit of rational civilization in his era. Furthermore, the maturity of his perfuming techniques parallels the evolution of art from classical to modern, eventually becoming a commodity of cultural industry. Although perfume can provide pleasure and satisfaction to its users, it cannot offer solace to the creator. When Grenouille becomes the master of the kingdom of sense, he detaches himself from this perfect, self-driven closed system leading to his own destruction. 
Renui's ruthless instrumental rationality results in a self-centered pathology, which is an inevitable issue in modern society. His loneliness, anxiety, and nihilism deeply reveal the survival dilemma of the individual in a materialistic society driven by reason. Of course, aside from these philosophical themes, it's hard not to be captivated by the sheer enchantment of the story itself. The novel's masterful capture and portrayal of sense are repeatedly mentioned. In today's rapidly changing landscape of communication media, the novelist's function of describing things through words has faced serious challenges, but only sense remain the final territory for contemporary novelists seeking uniqueness. In this sense, among contemporary literary works that focus on seeking unique sense, Susskind's perfume is undoubtedly an unavoidable milestone. So, in conclusion, this episode has taken you through the following main points. 1. Perfume is a representative work by German author Patrick Susskind published in 1984, blending various genres such as historical fiction, artists' coming-of-age narrative, and crime fiction. Unlike the traditional visual perspective in novels, the author uses the sense of smell as an entry point to present the details of the city, creating space for imaginative storytelling. 2. Grenouille's attempts to extract and preserve the essence of a particular entity through distillation can be seen as an unconscious effort to refine an individual identity, metaphorically reflecting post-war Germany's attempt to reconstruct a normalized national identity. The setting of the returning home theme at the end of the novel also aligns with the tendency in post-war German culture to re-establish individual identity and cognition through the theme of homeland. 3. Grenouille's journey from an instinctive follower of sense as a child to a skilled perfumer represents a dominant process in modern rational development, that of controlling, manipulating, and dominating nature. It also corresponds to the evolution of art from classical to modern, eventually becoming a commodity of cultural industry. The product of this ruthless instrumental rationality can only provide users with a false sense of happiness and may even push the creator into the abyss of destruction. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.